Hello all together. My name is Roland Reyer. I'm the technical specialist for Maya side of things in based in Germany. You can hear it from my accent. Um, I'm living in the area of Düsseldorf and today we are going to talk about the basics of Bifrost. So I'm trying to um, explain the very basics. If you already do Bifrost simulations, this might be a little bit boring for you, but uh, if you never touched it because you thought it would be too difficult and you know you have to dive too deep into the technical details, um, then this is the right thing for you. Here we start from scratch. You can, all the things that you see here, you can do immediately on your own machine. I have used a laptop for this preparations and so any, any, any kind of computer will do. <clears throat> um, the faster, of course, the better for Bifrost simulations. You need a lot of rendering power to be able to, you know, bump up the resolution and get re really nice results. So Bifrost, I was trying to collect, I was trying to collect some topics for Bifrost. When we talk about Bifrost, what, what is it? What are we talking about? Of course, it's the simulation of liquids like water and uh, honey, oil, lava, for instance, all that kind of stuff. And um, that is the main thing. So what we see of Bifrost is mainly ocean waves or, you know, a shore or a waterfall or something like that, um, that is simulated in, the, simulated in the computer, which is good enough. It's a very, it's a very good thing that we have that and we don't, we don't need to film water all the time in, in reality because some things are not so easy um, in reality. Bifrost also includes a module called Aero, which is there to simulate smoke, steam, clouds, explosions, and, and stuff like that. And my colleague, uh, John, John Paul Giancarlo, is going to make a separate webinar about the Aero things that you can do in Bifrost. At the end of this webinar, I'm going to share his name and you can find him easily on YouTube, for instance. And you will also see an announcement on the Meet the Experts website about this webinar. Um, we're going to talk about, um, uh, we are not going to talk about the Bifrost Ocean Simulation System called BOSS. That is something that I'm going to do in my next webinar, which is about water only. So we're going to talk about water, oceans, and you know, or water in all sizes. And there I'm going to talk about the BOSS system. In this webinar, we will touch motion fields because that is an important part to control water and to shape it or to push it into the right direction. Um, uh, there is something or there is a, a possibility in Bifrost to have a, uh, or to have the simulation be adaptive to the camera or to a certain mesh. So you can tell Bifrost, I want you to simulate only where the camera is or in the camera first room. So to make sure that, you know, it's not simulating around you or behind you, uh, it will only simulate the things that are actually seen by the camera, a very good thing. Um, I'll handle that in the next webinar because it's also more, you know, about oceans and big, big masses of water. Uh, the same with guided simulation. I'm not going to talk about this uh, in this webinar. Next webinar, we're going to do that. But here we're going to talk about caching and rendering the simulations. At least, you know, as the time, you know, depending on how much time we have for the whole thing, um, we can't go too deep into rendering. So we end up with something like this here, liquids, motion fields, caching and rendering. These are the things that we, we are going to talk about in this first basic um, version of the Bifrost webinar. And as I said, I will have another one, another webinar called Bifrost Water. And my colleague, John Paul Giancarlo, is going to make um, a webinar about viscous liquids and also about aero and explosions. So that might be interesting to you as well. So let's jump right into it, into the water. Before we start with the basics, I have to say something about the preparation of this, of this whole webinar. So normally I love to do live demos. So I love to, to open my and just you know, show everything live um, to also prove the point that you can do it live, that you can do it with your hands. It's not a sped up videos with video with all tricks behind the scenes. Um, you can do it live. 
in this case, it's not possible to do it live because the simulations, you know, even when you run up a small cache in Maya, uh, that takes too much time. And some of the simulations you see here, for example, one of the images that we have here on the right side, this simulation took like, in the highest resolution, took like three and a half hours to finish. And of course, you know, we can't wait for that. And even if it's all cached and it's pre-calculated, it takes too long to load the stuff. That's why I choose to record videos and to, you know, have all the simulations instantly there, which will be different, of course, when you do it at home. You will see that, you know, time passes well while you're looking at the, at the timeline and see, you know, another frame and another frame drops in. So that's why I'm, I'm, I, I'm playing videos from time to time. And of course, we, I'm going to stop it and, you know, recap what we have seen and highlight a few things that are important here. Um, um, for all the examples here, I've tried to show you everything that is necessary to do that. So all of the steps that are necessary to have this, um, this result. There's nothing behind the scenes. There are no secret, um, secret settings or so, something in the preference or so that you don't know about. So when you see something here and you follow all the steps, it should be possible to reproduce the same result with these settings that you see on the screen, that you hopefully see on the screen. We will see how Zoom um, does with the performance here and the quality. Okay, so first examples, we start from scratch or mostly from scratch. So what, what I'm using here is, uh, as models, um, you can build from scratch in a few minutes and you can you know, start right away. So we talk about the setup, the first setup, how do you make some liquid in your scene? Uh, we talk about colliders, collision objects. So as a container, for example, for your liquid, you need collision objects. We talk about kill planes. Kill planes are very important to erase things that you don't see anymore because it's useless to have water, water simulated that's far away already. Um, the scratch cache in the timeline. So it's building up a, uh, a cache so that you can scratch the timeline and see your simulation so far in a better, with a better performance. And then diagnostic colors, of course, how do you, how do you check your data, what you have simulated so far. And of course, we talk about the master voxel size. The master voxel size is the one value that drives the quality of your simulation, master voxel size. What the, I mean, the name says it already. Uh, you decrease the master voxel size, make it smaller, and then you have a higher resolution, better results, longer rendering times. Okay, and then scene size, the gravity and density, uh, you will see that it is important. I'm gonna show you an example. So let's jump right into the first, um, into the first video. I'm gonna check the sound here if you hear something, and I hope that is the case. Okay, let me start it. Now let's have a look at a very simple example of a liquid simulation that you can build from scratch in minutes and that helps you play with Bifrost and learn how it works. Here I have a box as my water container, a vat with a cutout that I've made from a simple polygon cube. Inside that tub there's another object, a cube, which will be the water. It fits exactly into the container so that the water doesn't need any time to settle. I can now easily turn the blue box into water by selecting it and choosing Bifrost Liquid. A bounding box appears around the water object and there are tiny little blue dots which are the water particles. The water box is still there. It works as an emitter for the water particles and must not be deleted. I can hide it with H but I'll keep it in my scene. Now we can see the water particles. They are only one pixel wide and sometimes hard to see. When I select the liquid object, either by the bounding box or in the outliner, I'll find a setting called point size, which defines the width in pixels just for the display that has no effect on the simulation. Let's set this to three for now. When I start the simulation now, the water will fall right through the container box because I have not yet registered the container as part of the simulation. I'll select both the liquid and the container, the order doesn't matter, 
and go Bifrost and under Add, I'll add it as a collider. Another object is added to the Outliner, a Bifrost Collider properties, which carries the settings for the collisions. Now I can hit play and watch my water simulation. When the liquid is selected, you can see colors in the timeline, yellow and green. The yellow frames are queued for simulation and the green ones are done already. I can stop the playback and scrub the timeline in the green area to see my simulation so far. You will also notice that Maya isn't slow even though the simulation is using all available resources. The yellow frames are still being simulated and you can stop this process by choosing Bifrost Stop Background Processing. We can see that the liquid is flowing out of the gap in the tub and then falls into empty space. The bounding box becomes bigger and bigger and that is a problem because it will slow down the solver a lot. So in case we need just to see the box in a close-up, we can remove those particles that fall down and escape the area of interest. I can create a kill plane to remove those particles that pass a certain region, in this case the plane below a water trough. Now those particles are deleted as soon as they cross the kill plane. Let's add some more stuff to our simulation to make it more interesting. I'll turn on a ground plane with some obstacles and add all of it as a collision object. In the outliner we can see that the new Bifrost Collision Properties node is added. Let's also add something to the water to get a bit more action. I create a cube, scale it up, place it above the container and make it wild. I'll select it with the liquid object and go Bifrost Add Emitter which makes it part of the existing liquid. Notice that in the outliner we see a separate Bifrost Emitter property node. We'll come back to that in a few minutes. I'll hide the splash box. Now a big cube of water is going to dash into the container and I hope it's going to splash properly. Let's start the simulation. Oh yes, this is much more fun. The water splashes out of the container, clashes on the ground and onto the obstacles and then runs off and is removed by the kill plane. You may have noticed that the particles somehow become brighter when they move. This is a diagnostic color setting from a liquid shape. Currently the velocity of the particles is used to address this ramp and pick a color for the particles. I can set the range for the velocity with these min and max settings. These settings affect just the display of the particles, very much like the point size. When I take a closer look at this simulation, I notice two strange things. The water that flows out of the cutout of the container has a different, much smaller size than the cutout. And the water doesn't seem to flow between these obstacles. It looks as if they were grown together. What's going on here? Although we only see particles acting, Bifrost is also using voxels to simulate density, velocity, churn, etc. and collisions of the liquid. The size of these voxels defines the quality, accuracy and the level of detail of the final simulation. Currently that voxel size is only 0.5 units as you can see here in the Bifrost Liquid Properties node. The grid in my scene has a spacing of one unit so that the voxelized objects would look like this. Now it's clear why the water flow in the cutout has that shape and it's also clear why there's no water between the obstacles. All calculations for forces, movements, details, etc. are done in this raster and you can imagine that this is not sufficient to simulate water with a necessary level of detail. On the other hand, this low resolution is fast enough for us to do the basic settings, position objects and to run the first rough tests. Here is a play blast of our simulation at a voxel size of 0.5, which is the default. If I halve the size to 0.25, I get 8 times as many voxels. I half it again to 0.125 and then again to 0.06. That amount of accuracy has its price, of course. 
This table shows how the voxel size affects the calculation time of the 120 frames in our animation. The lowest resolution has only very little detail, but the 120 frames were simulated in under 2 minutes. The highest resolution may not even be fine enough for production, but it took already 3.5 hours to calculate, that's almost 2 minutes per frame. Let's leave this at a master voxel size of 0.25 and a display size for the particles of 2. Now it's time to think about the size of the scene, because at the moment our simulation behaves like a fairly large amount of water and not like a small tub of water. The default values of Bifrost attributes are based on the assumption that one visible grid unit is equal to one meter when linear working units is set to the default value of centimeter. That means that in my example scene the water tub is about 10 by 10 meters in size. And now it becomes clear where this wide and dramatically slow movement of the water comes from. Our water tub is actually a small swimming pool. Let's change the scene size to something smaller in a simple way considering only gravity and density. In a large scene gravity may appear to be small and things fall slowly over large distances. To make a scene look smaller or 10 times smaller we need to multiply the gravity by a factor of 10. The density values of the emitters in our scene show a default value of 1000, which is the weight in kilogram of a cubic unit of water. Let's have a look at this calculation. By default one unit is one meter for Bifrost. One cubic meter is made up of 10 by 10 by 10 decimeters. One cubic decimeter equals 1000 cubic centimeters and that is one liter. And if it is water it weighs one kilogram. One cubic meter therefore consists of 1000 cubic decimeters or kilogram and that is what the number 1000 in the emitter says. So if we want to make the scene 10 times smaller then we divide the meter by 10 and then this block is only one cubic decimeters which equals 1000 cubic centimeters which equals one kilogram of water. And that is the value we need to enter in both emitters. One as for one kilogram of water for a cube of one unit. Coming back to our scene with one grid unit being one decimeter instead of a meter the whole water tub is now only one by one meter which should result in a different behavior. Let's compare the simulations. On the left side you see a large scene, a 10 by 10 meter pool with a 3 meter cube of water splashing into it and on the right side is the 1 by 1 meter tub with a 30 centimeter cube of water splashing into it. You can clearly see the different behavior. So that was a first, um, a first look at a very basic scene. Let's recap what we have seen here. So we were talking about the master voxel size, that's the one most important value in the, whole, um, in the whole simulation here. So let me take the text marker here. So master voxel size, that is the most important thing. Uh, with the master voxel size you control the whole quality, which is a very good thing because then you don't have to control 1000 different values um, to uh, to set a, set a certain quality or so. But of course there are more values to you know fine-tune the whole thing and to keep the master voxel size as high as possible because you you don't want so long simulation times. You've seen that it can take three and a half hours for, for a simple scene like this one here already so we want to keep it uh, keep it um, the resolution as long as uh, as low as possible. Check the scene size. Be aware of the scene size. When you build it already, be aware of the scene size and what you have to do to make it look like realistic water in that scene size. Or you, you know, um, you know, uh, intentionally change the scene size to make it look different, you know, like a slow-mo water splash or something like that. So scene size, very important. 
kill planes to remove unwanted simulations. You don't want something, you know, behind the scenes to happen with the particles that slow you down. Uh, combine the colliders. That is something that I didn't mention in the video, but I did do it. Um, you saw me combine these obstacles all together. So the ground plane and all the cubes that are the obstacles were combined into one collider properties object. And that's a good thing because if you want to set something for the collider or the emitter, for example, if you have combined these objects together, then you have just one setting in one place and you don't have to change it for a number of different objects. Diagnostic colors, you know, the white color for velocity of particles as soon as they move very fast. That is just one example. You can use the vorticity, the density, and, you know, a number of values to check what's going on on the surface of the water and to use that for settings, for example. We come to that in a, uh, in a few minutes. Okay, that was the first basic check. If you want to start with Bifrost, make it simple, make simple blocks and so, and a simple testing environment where you can play around with these settings and you should constrain yourself to the master voxel size, for example, and find out, you know, when it starts to get slower and slower. Okay, there are some questions. What are the specs of my computer? My computer is a, is a laptop, it's a Z-book, it's a pretty fast one. So it has a number of cores and a lot of memory also. It has 64 gigabytes of memory, of main memory. So that helps of course a lot. So especially when you, when you load a scratch cache or when you load a cache into memory, that, of, that is very helpful to have a lot of main memory. Um, but it's not the fastest, fastest machine under the sun. The problem is that if you have a fast machine, then you also bump up the resolution so much until it's slow enough. It's very much like with rendering. There is a, there's a pain point with rendering when it becomes longer than that, you do something about the rendering settings and it's the same here. So if it becomes too slow, you have to do something and say, okay, let's decrease the resolution and see how else we, what else we can do to make this render faster. So the master voxel size production should be not enough. Um, it depends very much on, on the scene itself. So there are scenes that are well, pretty okay with the, uh, 0 0.06 as a master voxel size. Even a higher master voxel size could be okay. It depends on the scene. So if you have a very large scene with, uh, with a ship in it, for example, modeled to real size, so a ship, I don't know how long a ship is, hundreds meter, meters. If you have that, uh, uh, that simulation, then the master voxel size will be much, much higher. Um, and you still have a very nice simulation. Only in small sizes, you know, you have to bump, to bump up the resolution or decrease the master voxel size to get all these little details. Can we just model the scene in meters and leave the gravity untouched? Yes, of course, you can. It's the same thing. You can also scale everything. If you realize, oh, I modeled in the wrong in the wrong units, you can scale everything up or down to get into the same into the correct um, into the correct sizes. Can you explain the gravity multiplication again? I will do that in one of the next videos again to give you an idea. There's also on the Maya Learning Channel there is an example of how to recalculate it using simple. Um, variables when you say like my ten, my scene is 10 times larger then I have to multiply the gravity or divide the gravity by 10. Um, I just shown this example of the tower and the pencil as you know a reminder like on the tower on the on the big scale it looks like the gravity is low because things seem to fall very slow. If you want this to make this smaller, then you rise the gravity so that it's boom, it's, it's on the ground already. That's my, you know, that's my, uh, my help here. Will there be a recorded version? Yes, I'm recording the webinar right now and I'm, and I'm trying to, um, to load this up as soon as possible. Okay, so let's go to the next one here. Uh, rain effect. Somebody's talking about the rain effect, so maybe the next example will show you already some, some examples. But there is a rain effect example 
on the Maya learning channel. Uh, I would have to ask a colleague how they have done that. I had already, I have already an idea, but yeah. Um, I would use little collision objects. That's one, one thing. And of course you can use uh, Bifrost uh, droplets to make the rain. But if you want to control rain, then use little collision objects. Let's step uh, to the next frame here. So now we want to animate the liquid. So right now we've used only gravity to animate the liquid. You know, have this box of water splash into the top and then animate something. Somehow, what if you want to animate a fountain, for example? How do you make the water, you know, come out of a nozzle? Um, normally, everybody would think about an emitter, for example, because that is, you know, that's how we think in the, in the 3D computer world. Uh, with an emitter, you emit liquid and then it splashes into the pool. In this case, I'm going to use the liquid that's in the pool already and just use a field that does that thing. Um, the message is here is be simple, you know, build up your scene as simple as possible, even if the pool has a very nice complex model, don't use that as a collision model, it's going to, it's going to slow you down. Uh, think about the thickness of every, all the collision objects. We talk about motion fields, talk about background simulation, what we currently do. And we talk about incrementalism. I look that word up, incrementalism. I, what I mean with that is that you start with low values and then try to increase them a little bit and see, is that okay? No, it's not okay, so increase that. Oh, then I have to increase that again. Okay, that is incrementalism. Get slowly, don't bump the resolution up, you know, uh, and then wait for three hours just to find out it's not good. Go slow, if, if possible. So let me start the video. In the next example, I'm going to make a fountain. Let's assume my supervisor gave me this expressive drawing. The fountain consists of a small round pool, maybe three meters in diameter, filled with water, and then a jet of water shooting up and falling back into the pool. The pool is very simple. I've made it from a poly cylinder using extrude. I just need it as a collision object. The actual rendered object will of course look different. Bifrost assumes each grid unit to be one meter, so the radius of our pool is only about 1.5. When you make such an object, you should have an eye on the thickness of the walls. Don't make them too thin because the Bifrost particles could fall through when they have a certain speed. If I model an emitter object that fits exactly into the container, then I don't have to wait for the water to settle in inside the container. In this example, I would simply duplicate the ground polygon and extrude it. Voila! I'll color the objects. You know the following steps already. Select the water and create the liquid. Hide the emitter and increase the display size of the particles. Make the container a collider. And finally, add a kill plane for the particles that slop out of or land beside the pool. Okay, that's very few particles. What's going on here? In the first example, we learned about the voxel size in Bifrost. By default, it is set to 0.5. Look how big the voxels are at that size. For this example, that's too low. Vertically, there's hardly any space for one layer of voxels. Let's halve the size to 0.25. That's better. But still, the pool isn't round and there are too few voxels for the water. For now, let's bump up the resolution to 0.125. The voxels would look like this. That seems to be okay for the beginning. That amount of particles looks better. Okay, wait, there's a gap between the pool and the water. This is still related to the voxel size. This offset from the actual surface is a safety distance to make sure that no particles will pass through the geometry. I can adjust the thickness of every collision object in the collider properties under conversion. Currently the thickness is related to the voxels, which means that it will change together with the master voxel size. 
I'll leave it as it is so that when I increase the master voxel size, this setting will automatically work better. For the water jet, I'm going to add a motion field to the liquid. The motion field is a multi-purpose field that includes a directional component, a vortex, noise, turbulence, and even a way to use the motion of geometry as a force field. When I start the simulation, I see that it is actually pretty quick. Queuing the frames for simulation and then going back to see the simulation so far is a few more clicks at the beginning of the setup. In this case, I personally like to turn off background simulation in the Bifrost settings so that I always see the frame that's currently simulated. Now when I hit play, the playhead always displays the last simulated frame. Ok, the field points in the wrong direction. Let's do the settings. In this section you can set an overall magnitude and turn on the various components. I'll leave just the directional field on. Down here are sections with controls for the field components. In the field direction section I can set a local magnitude, a direction vector and some settings that let you turn the field into a radial field, a vortex, etc. I'll just bump up the magnitude to 10 and set the direction to be Y. Aha! When the field points up in Y I need to increase the magnitude, global or local. And then the water behaves as if there was a turbulence field. But it is actually a result of the fact that the complete water body is lifted up by the field and it is drawn back by the gravity. To create a nozzle we have to set a size for the field or a boundary. When I enable that I can choose a shape and I'll pick the cylinder. And of course that's too big, I'll scale it down a bit. Ok, we seem to be on the right way. The main problem here is the fact that for the small nozzle we need a very small master voxel size. I'll increase the resolution or rather decrease the master voxel size to 0.06. And turn back on the background simulation because now it is too slow to watch it simulate single frames. The result is very turbulent. When the fountain falls back into the pool, it churns the whole liquid that even slops out of the pool. Well, that's actually no surprise because when we check the size of that nozzle, it turns out to be 20 cm in diameter. And that's a very solid and heavy jet of water. So let's make the nozzle smaller, maybe 7 cm. At this size, the simulation isn't smooth anymore. There are too few particles for the thin water jet, so you know what's coming, we'll increase the resolution. You see that it is a back and forth between the lowest possible resolution to keep simulation times short and the necessities of the scene that force us to increase the resolution. This is a master voxel size of 0.03, still not smooth. And this is 0.015. We are getting closer. This might already be good as an effect in the background. In the next step we have to think about caching the simulation to bake our current results and to avoid recalculation. Caching is pretty straightforward. Just select the liquid container and go Bifrost, Compute and Cache to Disk. You have the option to cache the simulation which includes voxels and particles and or to cache a mesh, a renderable surface. The cache files will be written into a folder with the name of the scene and the subfolders with the names of liquid containers. You can of course override that to use your own scheme. The write mode lets you either write the complete time range or append a cache to existing cached frames. When we start the caching, the current scratch cache will be erased and the frame range will be simulated. The caching flag and the name of the cache folder is automatically set here in the liquid properties container. You can also set this by hand if you want to load any cached simulation into your scene. When you load a scene with a cached file attached, the cache file will not automatically be loaded, this will take too long. 
When you select a liquid container that has a cache, then the timeline will be dark blue. When you start a playback, the queued frames will be yellow and the frames will turn green when they are loaded. This was the second example in my introduction to Bifrost. We've used our first motion field and slowly increased the resolution for the solver to get closer to the desired result. So you see with the motion field, you can, I mean, that is one, one very basic example for the motion field. To push liquid in a certain direction, you can use it without a boundary or with a boundary like this one here. But it's a, it's a very simple example of, of how you can do that. Um, and uh, I, I have to say, I was surprised myself how simple the setup for that scene is. But it has one problem, of course. You see that the fountain um, is disturbed by the surface of the water. So as soon as water drops back into the pool and starts to make waves, you know, the fountain becomes very unstable and, you know, falls to one, from one side to another one because of these waves, because it has to go, the new water has to go through these waves. So I found a very simple workaround for that. And that's this animation here. On the left side, you see the original fountain, like in the video, and on the right side, you see the workaround, which works so much better. The settings are identical in both cases. The simulation is the same times, um, but we have a little collider here. There's a little physical tube collider around this motion field to prevent the you know, the, the, the beam of water, the jet of water from these waves. So it's a very simple thing and it helps a lot and, um, uh, you know, makes, makes the simulation look so much better. So analyze your scene, think about what happens here and think about where, where do these problems come from and try very simple things to calm this down. <clears throat> so you can use a turbulence field, of course, to make the, the volume or your, your liquid more turbulent, but you can also use very simple um, things to calm it down and to reduce the turbulence. Um, so increase the resolution or decrease the master voxel size in steps incrementalism. So make sure that you don't overshoot with a simulation because that, you know, it's going to cost you a lot of time while testing the whole thing. If you know all the settings, you can bump it up all the way and simulate it over over the weekend or overnight. Um, but while you are playing, you want to keep it as low as possible and keep the parts as simple as possible. And always, you know, keeping the, in the back of your head, what's the master voxel size? What's the size of my voxels in the scene? Why does it behave in a certain way? So the screen resolution is too low. I don't know what's going on here because on my screen, on my second screen, it looks good. Um, it could be that um, Zoom scales it down because of a bad internet connection. Is there a way to loop the simulation perfectly? Um, not that I know. I know for particles there are ways to do that, to loop it perfectly because um, you would have to, you know, have an end frame as a kind of a goal and use that as a start frame again. I don't know if that is possible. Um, I keep it. I keep it in mind, and maybe I find a solution um, to to have it, you know, cycle as uh, uh, in a in a in a perfect way. But as far as I know, it works only with particles, because it's in this simulation. It's difficult to do, you know, both the voxels, the pressure, and everything, and the particles, the motion, and everything, um, to have a perfect cycle. I've tr I've tried already set the start frame or the, the start frame for a simulation at a certain frame. So basically the technique would be take the end frame, use it as an initial state, go back to the start and then, you know, start simulating. I'm not sure if that works. I keep it in my mind and maybe I, I come up with a solution. I'll post a video about it. Uh, what's the best way of creating small scale, heavily art directed? Um, we'll come back. I thought actually I had a video about that. So in the, in the next section, I have a video about this, uh, about, um, fields, 
or how you can use fields, how you can use these motion fields. So here in this video, we see some motion fields and using these particles without a gravity. So these motion fields are pushing and pulling particles in a certain direction. And that way you can art direct particles on a small scale. So these ones here are kind of um, torus-like fields. This is a, a cylinder field with around the axis forces to make a perfect wave. You know, out of nothing, you have a perfect wave crash. I don't know how this one is done, but it's, you know, it's using the same technique. It's only the one motion field with different options. This one here, the waterfall, is using a drag field to pull the, the water apart and create little droplets and those little droplets um, create all the foam. And this one is using geometry to attract the water into a certain shape. So you can heavily art direct the liquid using these fields, certainly possible. And this other video here is about um, geometry. When you create a motion field and you have also a geometry selected, then this geometry can act as a field. You can use this together with all the other features for the motion field. With inherent velocity, you can set the amount of influence that the actual geometry has on the liquid. Here I've got some examples for the things that you can do with a simple geometry. A rotating motion will of course create some sort of a vortex. Translations will also create very obvious motion. Note that the geometry is not acting as a collision object. But not only transformations are possible, all kinds of deformations will work like this bent deformer or like this vertex animation. Which leads to this example. That's a very simple wave deformer on the geometry. And if I apply that wave deformer to a polygon plane, then I get this. This is in fact the best method to create waves on a liquid. It works much better than to try to push the liquid with a collision object with just this simple motion field that has all these um, appearances, um, you, can, you can do a lot with particles and, and art direct them even in a, in a very small um, scale. Spline paths, um, not that I know. Maybe you can do something with geometry to, to create something like that. Um, but you know, a regular spline pass, water flows from here to there to there. No, no, uh, not with nerves. Maybe it would be nice as a suggestion um, to make the Bifrost team think about it. Can I use a tube sort of geometry to direct the liquid? Yes, um, that is what we just did, you know, with the nozzle. It is a, it's kind of a tube, but it's not, it's not a, you know, a hollow geometry. You can use that as a collision object. So you can really make shape a tube and push velocity or let, Velocity, uh, um, push the liquid through it and let it flow through it. Um, you can even place little fields in there to make sure, you know, it flows into all corners of your hollow geometry and fills everything um, as intended. How do you show voxels as shaded cubes? I've used the mesh pl plugin in Maya to create these voxel cubes. Um, just as a as a way to show it in Maya or in um, Bifrost, you find a switch to show on diagnostic um, voxel display because the voxel sizes are also adaptive. They are much bigger outside of the uh, of the liquid simulation, and it, you know the tiles become interactive. Um, that is not so nice to see. So I made these objects in in mesh. How can you emit fluid that is pressed out of a tube, for example? Sketch up. Okay, so emitters, when you have an emitter, the emitter has a value called uh, expand. Expand means that it, uh, it, it not only creates the liquid that is, you know, in this volume, and then the liquid would fall away from that emitter, um, you can have a continuous emission and then expand it and create more that's actually in this volume. So we're going to talk about uh, continuous emission in the next example. I'm not going to cover the expand example. So, you know, pushing something out uh, also means to force the liquid. And I can tell you Bifrost doesn't like that at all. Don't force the liquids. It, it's going to, you know, uh, you have to bump up the 
the resolution a lot and you have to cut the time into smaller pieces if you want to force the liquid do something like with a very high gravity that would be a uh, high force or to force it you know through a small nozzle and do something like you know squeezing ketchup out of a out of a bottle um, it is possible it's definitely possible always think about the fields if you want the liquid go through a certain shape or so think about the fields you know a directional field with a boundary that's exactly the one that you want in inside your bottle and then you know just feed some liquid to go after that. That will do already, that will do the trick. Okay, let's have a look at the next example because we're gonna talk about the emission or continuous emission in the next example. So what if we want to fill a container with liquid, like on the, you know, this example here, the image on the right side, um, what, how would we do that? I can tell you this, this emitter, and that was my answer to that question, this emitter here is continuous. Uh, it does not expand. So the liquid that flows out of it is simply pulled down and then the empty emitter volume is filled again with liquid that is also pulled down. So that's how it produces or keeps producing the liquid. If you don't transport the liquid away, it's not going to produce anything unless you expand, you push it out and that is a force and then you have to chop the time into smaller pieces. But we're going to talk about this in this example. So I, um, this time I first stop the video and then start, I first stop my, my uh, webcam here and then start the video. Just a second. Now let's have a closer look at emitters in Bifrost. We've used emitters already but only to create a static amount of liquid. For a constant flow of liquid we need to set something in the emitter. Again, I'm using a super simple setup to test things out. I have a simple trough and the box up here shall be my emitter. The goal is to fill the trough with liquid in a specific scene size. I'll make the box an emitter and the trough a collider. And I'll create a kill plane. In the emitter settings, I'll turn on continuous emission. The first simulation at the standard resolution of 0.5 shows that the emitter now keeps emitting. The liquid splashes into the trough, slops up the walls and does not fill the container. Hmm. Okay, before I even try to fix the problem, let me first check the scene size. The pool is too big. It is almost 20 by 20 meter. Let me scale everything down so that the trough is only one by one meter. Oh, and by the way, that's going to make the problem worse. I'll set the gravity 10 times higher to 98. And the density, currently it is set to 1000 because that is the weight of one cubic unit of water. Bifrost assumes one unit to be one meter. What's the new weight? If the new scene is 10 times smaller than the new cube of one unit is one meter divided by 10 is 10 centimeter. A cube of 10 centimeter filled with water is exactly one liter and weighs exactly one kilogram. Welcome to the beauty of the metric system. So I'll enter a one here for one kilogram. This is the same simulation at the smaller scene size. The higher gravity accelerates the liquid so much that the particles are pushed through the walls of the trough. Also, the liquid seems to disappear as if it would evaporate. The general cure is always to increase the resolution or rather decrease the master voxel size. This simulation was done with a four times smaller master voxel size. The particles don't get through the walls anymore, but the liquid still seems to disappear or at least doesn't add up properly. So let's turn back the master voxel size to 0.25 and see how we can solve the problems using some fine tuning options in the solver. At this resolution, there are some particles going through the walls of the trough. Looking from the top, we can clearly see that the particles travel in one frame more than the wall is thick. So in one frame they are inside the container and in the next frame they already are outside the container. We need to calculate more steps to get this fixed 
And that is in fact possible in the solver with these adaptivity settings. There are two sets of values, the transport step and the time step adaptivity. The transport steps help improve the accuracy of fast moving particles, while the time steps help improve the interaction with animated objects. How does that work? The adaptivity values define how far a particle can travel in one frame before its calculation is chopped into smaller pieces to make it more accurate. The current setting for transport step adaptivity means that the particle can travel up to five voxel lengths before it triggers more substeps. In our example, I've set the grid to show the voxel size. From frame 15 to 16, the particles travel nine voxel lengths. So the calculation will be done in two substeps. In the next frame, the particles still have that speed and again trigger a substep, but because the substeps still have about 4.5 voxels, some particles get through the collider wall, which is only four voxels thick. Here's a table for the adaptivity values that show how far the particles can travel before triggering a new substep. So let's increase the transport step value according to the table, maybe to 0.4. And in the resulting simulation, we can clearly see that the particles accurately stay inside the collision object. The min and max steps settings define the minimum and maximum steps. This way we can clamp the maximum iterations per frame and also easily set a minimum number of iterations. However, the adaptivity method has the big advantage that slow particles do not trigger extra substeps and are therefore faster in the calculation. The adaptivity is also highly dependent on the master voxel size. Let's say at a certain voxel size, the settings trigger new calculations when the particles travel more than eight voxels in one frame. All the red arrows in this example are longer than eight voxels. Now, when I decrease the master voxel size and the particles are still traveling at the same speed, they would travel through more voxels in each frame. Now, more of these arrows are longer than eight voxels, even if the arrows have not changed. As soon as you decrease the master voxel size, many of the problems are going to disappear. Therefore, it makes sense to adjust these adaptivity settings only when you have the desired master voxel size set and you still see problems like leaking colliders or inaccurate interactions with animated objects. Looking back, I have to say, I have to say that um, this is not so much about emitters basically it's more about you know the quality adaptivity settings the master voxel sizes so this should give you because that you know that is the most important thing how high do you have to go with your uh, with your resolution you have to go very high to get all the details of water you know the little drops that escape from the main water body and that kind of stuff um so before you increase the master, uh, before you before you increase this step adaptivity, make sure that you you don't produce something that is not necessary that will go away anyway later in the in the process. Like here in this example, we've seen that you know the problems that particle go through the collider are going to disappear as soon as I have a higher uh, um, a higher resolution or lower master voxel size. So, but I just want to make sure that you understand what these settings are, because in some cases you have to go do this one, do the adaptivity settings instead of the master voxel size, because these adaptivity settings can save you a lot of time. Um, uh, in the next example, we will see uh, one more application um, of this uh, in reality. So what we were talking about here is not so much emitters, it is more, you know, analyze your scene, find out what the problem is. Is that problem gonna go away when I increase the master voxel size? Do I want to increase it even further? Or, you know, is a problem gonna stay there and I have to do something about it? Also with the, you know, the thing with the water disappearing, there is a setting in the properties that erodes the water, that removes water to make, you know, create a crisp water surface and nice waves. 
Um, this is under erosion, you find these settings. You can set these values to zero all the way and uh, try them. So it could be that the water, the, you know, it works much better filling a container with water. And maybe, you know, you have to find a setting somewhere in between to make this, make it look nice. So with the erosion um, uh, settings, feel free to play around with it. It's nothing, nothing's bad is going to happen. You know, I was too careful with those. And I've seen that my colleagues, you know, just play around, set it to zero, set it to one and, and you know, compare the, um, uh, compare the values there. Okay, so shortly about the emitters, we didn't push the water out too much, um, uh, so we don't have problems. There's one question here, how can you morph one fluid shape into another completely different shape? You can use a geometry to attract, attract the water, the liquid, um, and uh, you know, that would be a way for me. You can, um, you can morph a, uh, a uh, morph emitters, for example, and try that way. Morph fields, so you have a motion field with a geometry. Try that um, to bring, you know, change the values, and one motion field fades, and the other one um, is is kicking in. So to to shape the water like that, I would try that immediately. Another question. So I want to control the velocity of the particles. So for example, when particle speed is exceeding, exceeding 10 kilometers per second, oh, 10 kilometers per second is a lot. Um, there are uh, maximum velocity settings uh, in the properties, uh, in the properties node, I think, where you can set a maximum velocity so the particles don't go over that. So that would be your way to keep the particles from, you know, overshooting, from overreacting. And also you can chop the time into smaller pieces. If you know particles are exploding, I had these cases when I turn on surface tension, for example, everything explodes and flies away. Uh, yeah, chop the, everything into smaller pieces and then, you know, the time especially, and that's gonna work fine. So chopping time into smaller pieces, we're gonna see that in the next example. I have to speed up a little bit because we are running over time already. So in my next example, I'm gonna use viscosity of something. And here we have this problem of uh, the time steps that we need to chop the time into smaller pieces, I have a higher frame rate, so to say. And this is my example here. I'm gonna turn off my video and then start this recording here. With this same scene, I'd like to talk about an attribute of liquids that we did not yet address, viscosity. In all my examples, I've simulated water, which doesn't seem to have any noticeable viscosity. Of course, water does have a viscosity, but it doesn't play a role in our simulation, especially not in larger scenes. But if we want to visualize viscous liquids like honey, oil, chocolate or lava, then we need the viscosity setting. There will be a separate webinar about viscous liquids by my colleague John Paul Giancarlo, where he gets more into the details. In my example, I'm using a continuous emitter and since the ground plane is still about 2 meters wide, I'll bump up the viscosity setting to 600. As you can see, this is already pretty stiff, but it still melts together after some moments. This is of course just the first rough test at the default master voxel size of 0.5. When the overall behavior is okay, you can start to increase the resolution, which means to decrease the master voxel size. I'm going to set it to 0.125, which is 64 times the number of voxels. It looks much better now, but there are these weird segments the segments are artifacts of the emitter that we normally don't see in thinner liquids. Close to the emitter, you can see what's going on. In each frame, the emitter is filled with liquid and only the gravity pulls it down, freeing up space in the emitter to emit new liquid. So this is actually a problem with our frame-based animation approach. We can now chop these segments into smaller pieces by either increasing the frame rate or with the time step adaptivity minimum steps. I'll set this to two to get twice the number of calculations per frame. No, wait, let's use the adaptivity setting. 
To visualize it, I'll set the grid size to 0.125, the same as the voxel size. I want to trigger more calculations up here where the particles travel 4 or more pixels per frame. So I set the adaptivity, according to the table, to 0.6 or higher, so that there are extra steps when the particles are faster than one voxel per frame. I'll also set the maximum iterations to 16 to see how high it'll go. Here's the result. Before, after. That's good, isn't it? The iterations went up to 10 for some frames. You can see this information in the Bifrost head-up display, which also shows the number of voxels and the number of particles. Be careful with the time steps, because each time step executes all transport steps, so that simulations become pretty slow when you bump up both values. So here you've seen an example of me um, increasing the frame rate, so to say. So if we need to chop the time into smaller pieces, instead of just saying, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have a larger frame rate and therefore, you know, I make more time steps, um, the adaptivity makes sure that it's only doing that where it's necessary, where the particles travel very fast and therefore trigger this, this recalculation. That's a very smart way actually, and it's, you know, keeps your simulation um, times short so that you don't have to, you know, each time when you, when you double the frame rate, for example, you would have twice as long time for a simulation. So the adaptivity helps you make that better. Again, analyze your scene. You see it here on the right side. Analyzing means try to visualize how big is your master voxel size, for example, with a grid. That's easy. Um, try to understand what's going on here. Why is it behaving in a certain way and just, you know, pick the right value uh, to make that. I could, of course, also in this example, just increase the master voxel size until it is nice, it's, uh, until it is good. Um, at a certain point, this would certainly happen. But as I said, I'm simulating that on a laptop and I try to keep the simulation times as short as possible. There was a question, uh, how could you in Inject thick fluid into an object. Um, yeah, uh, the, I have a question already. So to inject the thick fluid, that means to force it into, you know, force it into a certain region. So what you could do, of course, is to create a collision object. You know, so instead of having some liquid and a pump and, you know, pump it into a closed object, uh, you don't have that in, in Bifrost. So what you need to do here is to have, uh, you know, a collision object, for example, in there, an emitter with an expand setting. So it pushes out the liquid that you want to inject and try that, you know, with a certain expand setting, you produce more liquid than there is volume. So it it's going to push the, it, itself into, into the container, or into the object. That's one way. Another way would be a force field. So a motion field, a direction motion field, for example, at you know, the size or the shape of a pipe, and you know, keep feeding the liquid into that object and push it. One advantage of Bifrost is that you don't have to deal with the air in that object. So you don't have problems with air keeping the liquid into the last corner. Um, there is no air. So it's not dealing with air density, uh, it's just the liquid. So you can push it and it will fill all corners of the empty object. I would try, I would have to test it. I've never done that before, but that's, you know, having little fields uh, to make sure, you know, the liquid also goes in this corner here. That's actually a good idea. And that way you can art direct um, what your liquid is doing. Let's go on to the next one here, the, or the last one, the last video uh, in, this, in this presentation is about rendering. How do we render um, these particles? It's pretty simple when you use Arnold, and that's actually a good idea to, in the first place, just use Arnold and see what, what comes out of it, because that's very straightforward and very simple, and you get results um, right away. So by default, it's using an implicit surface. You see here the, the examples of the two renderings. On the left side, we have the Im implicit surface, which means it's gonna create a surface directly from the particles. It's mathematically not very difficult. 
And on the right side, it has turned this thing into a geometry. So we are talking about a polygon object. The two are different because this one here, the implicit surface is set in Arnold to be non-opaque. So it's transparent and it has a transparent shadow according to its transparency settings. And this one here on the right side has an opaque shadow. So it's not set to be transparent. If I set or uncheck the opaque flag on this one here on the right side, it's gonna look very much like this one on the left side here. Okay, so with that said, let me start the video. Let me Let's use this example to have a look at rendering a Bifrost simulation with Arnold. I've added a physical skylight to my scene and increased the intensity a bit. This is the initial render. The liquid has some water shader attached. It does some ray tracing and casts a very subtle shadow. What we see here is an isosurface around the particles that is created at render time. You can do some adjustments to control the creation of this isosurface and you can also cache this isosurface as a geometry. The settings for rendering are in the Bifrost shape node named Liquid Shape 1 here. I'll close the display section to get a better view. When you open the section Render, you have the choice how to render the Bifrost shape. By default, it is set to Surface. It will create an isosurface at render time. Points. That's actually the particles rendered as small spheres. And volume for a cloudy volumetric effect. The settings for each render type are down below here. The layout is a bit confusing. Maybe you better collapse the sections you don't need. For the surface rendering, there is by default a water shader attached. Since we are rendering with Arnold, this is just a transparent AI standard surface shader. When you render as points, then the AI standard surface shader will simply be applied to small spheres. In the case of the water shader with ray tracing, this is a bit over the top. When rendering as a volume, you need to assign a volume shader, otherwise you won't see anything. In the surface controls, you have the choice to create the surface from the voxels or from the particles. Voxels is the default, but when you set this to particles, you get some settings to influence the creation of the surface. These settings are available to all renderers and it depends on the renderer to use them or not. So currently it is so that each time we start a render, there has to be a surface created that can be rendered. This process can also be cached, which further reduces the possibility of things breaking in the production pipeline. You can enable the output of a separate mesh in the Bifrost shape under Bifrost meshing. There are the exact same settings as in the render settings of the node, but the two are independent from each other. As soon as you turn this on, there will be the polygon mesh object visible in the scene. It has the same AI standard surface shader attached to it as the ISO surface of the particles. You should then hide the particles or voxels, otherwise you would render both objects. To cache this mesh together with the simulation, turn on the Mesh option under Cache Elements in the Compute and Cache to Disk dialog. If you already have the simulation cached and you just want to also cache the mesh, then enable Bifrost Meshing, select the Mesh object and then go to Cache, BIF Cache, Export Selection to BIF. With this Polygon Cache, you can delete the Bifrost nodes from your scene and import the cached meshes as a new object. Assign a shader and you are ready for production. So you see, going to render that is pretty straightforward if you use, if you use Arnold anyway. Uh, you can use other renderers. If you cache the geometry, any renderer will do, will do. Just, you know, write out the geometry and it works all fine. Of course, it's a resolution question. I mean, this is a very problematic example here because um, just such a viscous liquid melts together. So, the, you know, the surfaces touch and then they melt together. And you need a very high resolution to get all the details and, you know, the sharp edges between the different 
uh, layers of viscous liquid. Um, so I found that a little bit problematic. So we, you know, this is this uh, example here has a very um, coarse resolution and too coarse actually to to look anywhere nice. And the same for water, of course. When you simulate water, you have all these little droplets, and you, it's really hard to turn them into uh, geometry and to preserve all the details that are necessary there. Um, so. Uh, with the geometries, sometimes you know you have to cheat a little bit, and we're going to talk about that in the next webinar about water. How to cheat with the little droplets? That is the foam actually that you would create to produce water spray and little bubbles under underwater or little spray that is surfing on top of the on top of the surface here. So um, depending on your renderer, of course, you know some things are easier and some things are harder depending on the uh, depending on the renderer check with your renderer vendor uh, if they can render that directly the bifrost stuff otherwise you would have to cache geometry or cache points you know it can write out uh, all kinds of um, various caches good so we are coming to an end already let's recap we have looked at you know, basic starts, how to start with a very, very simple scene. So there's nothing to download, no special scenes to download here. You can all build from scratch um, what you've seen here. You can start create liquids, emitters, play with vis viscosity, the resolution and the scene size, play with motion fields, um, cache the simulation as data and as geometry and render the whole thing. So start playing around. In a few weeks, we're gonna come up with the water webinar, uh, I actually mean this one here with the Bifrost water webinar, it is scheduled for February 22nd. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about the water in general. I'm trying to cover small amounts of water as well, but I'm telling you that is difficult to simulate. So if you can film it somehow, a small amount of water, do the filming. Otherwise, if you try to simulate that, you need very high resolutions and high frame rates to really capture that because it's a difficult thing to capture or to simulate water in that size. Bigger amounts of water like the around the ship or a shore or a waterfall are much simpler to create and produce um, better results in shorter simulation times and with lower resolution. With that, I'm going to go back one frame here um, for the links section. My name is Roland Reyer. You find the, my email address here. Don't um, hesitate to write me an email. But um, keep in mind, I'm going to go on holidays tomorrow. So last day, last chance for you. Uh, otherwise, in February, on February 12th, I think I'm going to be back and answer your questions. Um, you can also find me on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel and I will post these videos as much as I can on uh, YouTube, maybe all together as one piece or as single pieces. I don't know. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. And um, also have a look at the Maya Learning Channel. There's a Bifrost section. You have to search for Bifrost and then you find some interesting Bifrost examples that may be two or three years old, but many times are still um, accurate and tell the, the right story, especially, you know, this thing about the time step adaptivity and um, uh, transport step adaptivity. And my colleague, John Paul Giancarlo, is on a, also going to make um, Bifrost webinars in the next time. So check out this uh, Meet the Experts website. With that, I thank you very much. I'm going to upload the recording as soon as possible. Keep checking the website and my YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.